everybody? everybody? Are you ready? Are you guys ready? All right. Hey, everyone. Children, why are you still talking? The teachers are. All right. All right, guys. Okay. Okay. So, you do not have to pay attention to us because it might not be interesting. So, if you want to keep talking. You're definitely welcome to continue in the back yard. There's a whole scene out there with a the fire. Um, if you want to be part of the event, that's cool too. And you can like, you know, egg us on or, or like make raucous jokes in the background. <laughs> and I think we might have the chance. So the, people are already writing in questions. So we were going to do the, um, hey Molly, could you do the, turn off the amp for me there? We're going to do like some questions from the Facebook uh, internet people and then if anyone here wants to has questions or wants to like put in stage questions or anything you're that you think would be fun to like talk a snarky about, comment yeah, yeah then you could come up you know like and then we're like oh we have questions from the audience and you can come up and you can talk into this microphone and be on the thing and that adds to the fun i got this idea from a, like we did a podcast at, a, at another event in seattle once and this other blogger the mad scientist did a uh, episode of his podcast with the, the live studio audience and the people were coming up and even though it was only audio it turned out to be super funny and everyone's like cheering he's like excellent question oh even though it was a super boring question <laughs> uh, something and uh, so anyway this is all inspired by his idea I think it's like yeah if we're gonna talk about personal finance we should make it ridiculous and fun at least clap at random moments. To yeah, me. right. Because yeah. um, it's not really, we all know, right, it's not actually about personal finance. It's about bigger bigger sources of fun, and money is just one of the, the tricks you can do. So are we broadcasting already? We are, Scott? yeah. Okay. Yeah, our first bit of feedback yeah, oh was... Oh, my goodness. 300 people watching. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. And they had said, if it's possible, get everyone to stop talking. It's hard to hear you. And that's why I started yelling. Oh, then, yeah. I apologize. I didn't even know we were on. Hi, <laughs> hi audience. Yeah, we've been live. Welcome to the headquarters of Mustachianism. <laughs> I'm not sure. I guess the people inside this camera can't see what's behind the camera. Right, right. yes. Can I spin it safely? No? no. Okay. No, the cameraman says no. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I'll do a quick intro of myself and then I'll ask Pete to intro himself. A lot of people, so my name is Jesse Meekham. I'm the founder of You Need a Budget, but for speed's sake, I'll just say YNAB. And uh, you know, some, of you, some of you guys use it and the rest of you don't, and I, I'm not offended by that. It's fine. We are so, dressed. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, so we're wearing each other's complimentary shirts. shirts. <laughs> so, just no to show. confusion at all. Yeah, yeah no yeah. confusion. So. Um, and yeah, I came out to Longmont. Pete and I are good friends. We've been friends for a while, but hadn't been to Longmont yet, so we're out here doing this. And then, Pete, if you want to intro yourself for the people that haven't heard of you yet, Ooh, that's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> there are many, many that haven't on my side of the realm, and that's, that's who he's talking to in this moment, maybe. So That's true, okay. So, hi, YNAB strangers. I'm Pete. <laughs> uh, Mr. Money Mustache. So, I write a personal finance blog that's incorrectly represented as an extreme frugality blog, and really, it's a, it's a happiness through badass living blog that just happens to save you a bunch of money so that you can retire much earlier or do fun stuff much earlier than you would otherwise do. So do the quick like 10 second, 20 second story. I'll start. So you and Simi were married, didn't have any children, but you wanted to have a child. Right. Now you keep going. Okay. So as a young man, I grew up in Canada, which is a less spend, used to be a less spendy country than the U.S. So, and then I moved to the U.S. to have this fancy job as an engineer. And I didn't know that you were supposed to spend all your money. So I, <laughs> I was like, wow, I'll just keep it. So anyway, this money built up. And so then when I, you know, paired up and got married and we were gonna, getting ready to have a kid, we figured, well, with this extra salary that we're saving, why don't we make it so we don't have to work before we become parents instead of waiting to like 30 years after that. So that's what we did. That happened about 12 years ago. And then we lived a normal life, but then later, I started occasionally typing some shit in the computer about the subject, and that's grown into the side project, which is this blog, which now has a logo, and Jesse's even wearing the yes, shirt, so that's how you know yeah. it's big. And I only wear important stuff. So uh, the first question was, where do we get the YNAB swag? So we should say that this is, there's one of a kind. 
you cannot get this shirt any longer. This so. had to be custom printed yeah. to my dimensions because I, <laughs> I wore out the other one that was also custom printed. So that one's no longer available. And how many people are here? Because that was another question we got. How many people, probably, I don't know, 50, 60? Yeah, yeah that we sold 80 free tickets, and I'm not sure if how many people are outside, but it's a fairly full room. Actually, I have an idea. So if you keep okay. the host going, I will. I'm going to do something. It's funny. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's supposed to be happening right now. So, um, so the yeah, he excused himself to use the restroom, I think. But um, so what the focus for today is? I, I had the the thought. I originally wanted to just have Pete on. I haven't promoted him to Wineb for several years. The last time was when he came on our podcast. And lots, I don't know what this is still, but lots of uh, wine abbers heard Pete's message and liked it and they want to do well with their money. And, and so um, I thought we should just do it again. So I'm trying right. to intro. Everybody say hi <laughs> to the live studio audience. <laughs> there we go. Excellent. Kind of works. Did it go on the gunner? This is... This is the most professional production I've ever seen. <laughs> so, that's been me. That's awesome. This cameraman wouldn't let us turn the camera no, around. No, no. Jeez. Um, so I wanted to ask you, Pete, when you're, when you're teaching people, in, I know you start a lot of times with money, or at least they come to you because of money, and then you ease them into the real philosophy. But let's just start with money and keep it simple for a moment. Um, you talk about the, uh, I'm going to butcher this, the radically simple or crazy or something calculation. Simple math. I know what you're well, talking yeah, about. Yeah, please yeah. tell me what that was. Okay, the, the shockingly simple yes. math behind early retirement. And it's a good way to get people into this whole idea, like kind of fish them in, is because everybody's always saying, well, I know what retirement is. It's like, you know, our grandpas and grandmas used to be able to do that, but now you can't because life is too hard. And like maybe when you're 80, but probably never. <laughs> And no one has any idea what, what it actually means to retire. So the shockingly simple math is that if you just have, if you can figure out how much money you spend each year, add that up, write that number down, and then multiply that number by about 25, somewhere between 25 and 30, depending on how cautious you are, that amount of money is how much you need to retire. So if you can live on $1 a year, then you need $25 a year. $25 one-time chunk of money, invest that, and that will feed you for life. So if you have ten, you know, if you have a hundred thousand dollar expense, it's going to obviously take a lot, two point five million dollars, to retire. So the idea is you take this shockingly simple math, the number twenty five, and then you scale down your spending, figure out how to live happily on something less than hundred thousand dollars a year, preferably, and then suddenly, um, early retirement becomes way more feasible than what most people think, and that's what we did back in two thousand five. And it's been a, a really happy story since then. And there are now, since then, there have been hundreds or thousands of people who do the same thing. A bunch of people in this room I know have actually quit their jobs in their 30s or early 40s already and just live doing whatever they want. They still generally work hard on stuff. And that's the other misconception is retirement does not mean the golf cart and the television. You're not even allowed to use a golf cart or watch television. <laughs> Uh, it means getting engaged to stuff that you really care about because it turns out that humans are pretty much wired to want to be hardworking at least some part of each day. And it's a joyful thing. You never want to give that up. It's the only way you're going to stay in shape and keep your mind active. So it's not early retirement in the sense of not working. It's, it's the freedom to do your best work. So that's what I've discovered after 12 or 13 years of not having a real job is I work just as hard. It's just a lot more fun kind of work. Yeah, you might even... I, you, I would maybe wage that you've, you're, you've had to battle becoming busier as other stuff has kind of taken off and these demands have come onto your time and yeah, you have I this mean, headquarters now. This is a Saturday and I'm making a fake TV show. I know, that's show. really bad, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you, could be, you could be golfing, and well, maybe not in winter, but something along those lines. Yeah, yes. absolutely. The golf course is open and you might have noticed today. That's true, with no snow that had happened. So they, uh, Megan asked, uh, how did you guys get to know each other? And that was several years ago at the first Chautauqua uh, that's in true. Ecuador. Is that so. a question from the online? Yes, it was. Oh yeah, so that's true. Um, the neat thing about mustachianism is that I'm kind of lazy. Like, as I said, I only occasionally type stuff in the computer. And that means that people who are into the movement, into meeting each other, like everyone in this room, they organize themselves because they're like, Pete's not going to do the work for us. 
So <laughs> these events have started forming by themselves. And one of those events is a series of trips to Ecuador, where a bunch of people, 25 people, gather and tour around a small area and do hikes and talk about life. And, and you know, we do some talks and help people with solving problems. So Jesse was one of the attendees of that first uh, trip, which was about five years ago. I'm not sure exactly why he came, but it turned well, out to be... I think I came because I thought interesting people would go to a, a strange trip like that, and I was right. Yeah. <laughs> that was interesting people. So. Right. And I didn't even really know about You Need a Budget. Um, I think I, I had heard a little bit from the whole financial blogosphere that I learned existed, but I didn't know too much, and I definitely hadn't met you. So, so then we had like a one-on-one -on -one talk and realized... Realize we like to both like to do pull-ups, so yeah. <laughs> our friendship, our friendship was blossoming at that point. Um, okay, Chris asked when. Okay, apparently, yeah, Chris asked when is the book coming, comma Pete. Um, Your book. No, oh yeah, so Jesse book. wrote a book this now, year. Now we can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, apparently, it's number three on the uh, Wall Street Journal. Yeah, we did well. <laughs> So I don't have to write a book. It's all right. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm, I'm excited for the book as well. There, you wrote a post about how, or you have a plan for how the book will come to be. So I think that's true. I can talk about, um, you know, I have no idea if I'll write a book because I, I'm currently talking to you, for example. There's always some reason I'm not writing a book, and this has been going on for multiple years. <laughs> but if I ever do, it will be like I'm gonna stop writing blog posts for a while, and I'll write book posts instead. So that way, I'm keeping the blog alive, but but making. Um, you know, making book content and then everyone can crowdsource edit it and then we'll wrap it all up and put it out as like a really nice author and user combo effort and then it can be, and that way it's cool because it's free you read it on the blog if you want to but it's also available on Amazon and I feel like it'll sell pretty well because in America you know how it is, if you have a choice of getting something for free or paying for it, people always want to pay <laughs> the maximum amount they can. So it's a win-win. Okay, so let's go back to some talking about, like, you had this idea of the shockingly simple math. 25 times your, your spending rate gets you to financial freedom. I say that instead of retirement so we don't have these ideas of, uh, you know, you can soap say that. I'll keep saying whatever. early retirement. You want to say early retirement. Okay, well, let's go early retirement then. <laughs> So uh, Terry says, what is considered too late to begin? Um, well, if you're dead, that's too late. <laughs> <laughs> so earlier than that's fine to start? Yeah. Okay. Because all it really means, like the whole thing, all I ever write about really is just start running your days a bit more of a tighter ship where you're not wasting your money and your effort and your energy on stuff that doesn't make your life better. So if you want a better life, you can begin right now. And it could be as simple as like, you might have normally driven your car to the grocery store that's like a mile away and instead you walk there with a backpack and like, that's your first score. You've made yourself stronger, you've saved a tiny bit of money from driving and you've become tougher and then that compounds into the next day. You're like, I think I'm gonna solve another problem and, and then it can get bigger and bigger and it compounds like a snowball into hundreds of thousands of dollars of changes in your life because you're, you're solving problems in a better way. That's always win-win, I always say, it has to be win-win where your life becomes better and you save money. You don't want to do something where you lose in order to save money. Yeah, absolutely. So, oh, they're coming in, they're coming in fast now. <laughs> um, Elvis, any New Year's resolutions? I, I'm messing with one right now. I don't know if this is for me or Pete, but I'm, I read a New York Times article about not buying anything for a year. And there's not it. So people are like, dude, I've been doing that for four years. I lose that about it, but I'm gonna try it for one. Uh, so I'm I'm in the middle. Like as we as I flew over here, I was crafting what uh, what my rules would be. I think I should be allowed to have some rules. So that's one of my New Year's resolutions is to not buy anything for a year with some asterisks attached to that. Um, and then another one is to squat 400 pounds. So those two I'm gonna focus on. Sounds good. What about you? Um, hmm, I'm not really. And don't a, couch it as a New Year's resolution. Like yeah, goal, you know. It kind of breaks. Like I, I don't like New Year's resolutions because I make daily resolutions instead. But I kind of been moving towards uh, working a bit harder this year because I, I have these waves where I work too hard and then I'm like, oh, my life is just you know a busy mess. So then I pare it back and then I became too too lax a little bit. So this year I'm kind of taking the 
the blog stuff a bit more seriously, which is, makes me more likely to write a book, but still not likely enough for it to happen. Don't make any promises. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm Way doing to go. more. You that down. It's good. I'm just working harder on it for the last couple of months. You know, writing more, re- researching more, having this event right here is an example of of taking it seriously. And, yeah. And uh, but other stuff has already been going fine. I mean, this sounds like maybe a little bit like I don't know overly positive, but I feel like everything's running well. You know, I. I get enough exercise, I'm eating lots of salad, like what else do you need? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Family's well. Uh, personal question from Katie. Uh, Pete, what kind of music do you like? I'll peg you as, oh, she's already got a read on you. Um, <laughs> I'd peg you as a widespread panic or green ski bluegrass guy. Huh, I wonder if that, any of that's based on the shirt I'm wearing right now. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I'm. Uh, Definitely a musical slut in the sense that I listen to all, <laughs> almost all types, uh, like uh, even like country or electronic music and stuff. So I kind of need a lot of variety. Things. Only thing I don't like is wailing ballads. Like Celine Dion is my arch nemesis. <laughs> like that's the worst. Well, I won't say who my favorite is. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. Is it ever okay? Oh no, hold on a sec. Uh, my wife and I just paid off student loans and are now debt free. Excellent. Um, this is from this is from Chris. We are in the beginning stages of becoming first-time homeowners. What are your top five? And it has to be five. <laughs> what are your top five tips for the home buying process and good resources? You've bought homes. You've been in that space. Well, so, yes, I have. Yeah. Now that you mention it, yeah, absolutely. Oh man, do I have top five? I, I wrote an article once called "How to Buy a House." So if you look this up, you might find it. But I would say. Oh yeah, I know a good one. Don't pick a house that makes you have to drive places if you can at all avoid it. If just think of it, pretend that cars don't exist when choosing your house, and um, and luckily they still will exist, and you'll still have your cars. But by pretending they don't, you're going to make much better decisions, and you won't be burning your whole life like in traffic, and you won't be subject to other people's control. You're going to be in control. So it's worth paying a lot more for a house, and or picking a smaller space in exchange for being near what you like to do and like what your kids like to do. Make sure you live near people that you actually want to hang out with. That's so, number one, two, three, and four. Yeah, that's yeah. good. And then five was, yeah, keep it keep it small. I mean, like, I mean, you've done that experiment where you, you guys downsized many years ago. And yeah, four, only four now four years in the current ago, house. And, and it seems uh, like you're happy with it. Yeah, it, it yeah. was no problem. Just use your, your place efficiently. Um, and the other thing is, Think about what the house could be. Because I'm a construction guy, I always think in terms of what you can do to the house. And a lot of people look at the house too much like it is. And they're like, well, I really don't like this floor plan or I hate these pink tiles. So let's buy the house that's 50 miles away instead because it has the right color of carpet. And uh, everything in the house can be changed except the location. So think about the location before and then be willing to, you know, you can live there for 10 years. If it takes you 10 years to fix it up, to the way you want, then that's still a win in the, in the end, and you'll enjoy the journey too. So yeah. buy fixer uppers. Nice, excellent. That's two, okay. two points. Yeah, it was five. Let's see. Um, is it ever okay to finance something? A car, comma, don't jump on it yet. Or <laughs> col- college tuition, et cetera. Um, you can finance, you're allowed to finance things that go up in value sometimes, as long as you could really afford it. So a house is, it's okay to get a mortgage. It's financially often an advantage to get a mortgage when the interest rates are cheap like they have been forever. Um, but no, you can't borrow money for a car. A car should just be like whatever money's in your wallet. That should be, you know, get a car with that money because in general, it's, uh, it's just a luxury, you know, weather protection device. You don't need to be like getting one that's so expensive that you don't even have the money for it. Uh, and then tuition, uh, I think... Generally, we have kids starting long before they start school. So if you're going to pay for your kid's tuition, you can figure that out in advance so you don't have to borrow for it. And the kid themselves will probably know, too. Like, I started working in convenience stores and gas stations and hardware stores and construction all through high school to pay for my uh, schooling. And that I think that was good 
for me because I needed some discipline. So I think kids should pay for as much as they can of their own education too. That's a Canadian thing. And the Americans are like, oh, well, you're not a good parent unless you pay for 100%, including room and board and food, and they have to have a car, and they have to have spring break trips. And like, that's, that doesn't happen in Canada. I think it's better to not make this uh, free ride for your kids yeah. because everybody wins if they, if they pay for it. Help them develop a little grit. Yeah. Um, are these all questions for me? Like, how come your I'm, people I'm are assuming, asking me questions? I'm assuming they are, yeah. Um, I, I have a hard time with uh, the college tuition because I feel like it's overpriced. So I have a hard time borrowing for something that you feel like you're overpaying for. Yeah. yeah it just doesn't feel... And so it's a big variety of prices too, right? Like, very. you can have at Colorado University, it's like $7,000 a year last time I looked, which is not that long ago. Or you can pay forty or $50,000 a year at some other place in another state. And that's got to be one of the factors. Yeah, absolutely. That's the other America thing. It's like, well, I'm not a good parent unless I pretend they're all the same price. Because like, I can't deny Junior the best. <laughs> so if Junior wants to get $50,000 scholarship, I can't say for college tuition. I can't say anything. Yeah. You know, can't say anything about the money. Yeah, money matters. I mean, a lot of times when we're teaching people how to budget, maybe they're just starting, we talk about reality. Like, you know, it is what it is. So people often say, like, oh, I, I don't want to deal with that because that just makes me sad. And it's just, it's reality. So you just got to, you know, look at it and face it. And I think a lot of times kids need good doses of reality. And this is how things work. And we start our kids on our software when they're eight. And uh, it's fun to watch kids. They have no problem limiting their money or prioritizing what they want so we I line up my eight-year-old and say don't you want this and I try and stoke the fire don't you want this don't you want this don't you want this and he's like yeah I want all those things I forgot I even mentioned those things and we're making a list and then I say well here's how much money you have and he's just like well I only want this one you know and so as adults we feel like we can't do that but we can't it's about prioritizing kids are a lot better at it than we are so I have a question for Mr. Converse running the, the system here how many people are tuned in right now? Just under 700. Wow. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not too, uh, and they, they keep rolling in, too. Not too so. much pressure. They're very productive for questions, considering the number. Yeah. Um, let's see. Do, uh, if you guys have any... Yeah, any questions any, from you guys, too. Come up? Okay, cool. What's the square footage of your house? Would you like to uh, say it just into the microphone to, to add? <laughs> Uh, it, it's set up. You don't have to touch it. It's oh, really? Your people behind it. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Our first question is from Chad. Thanks for coming. <laughs> you, were, you were talking about your house and being a construction guy. So the question is just how big is your house? What's the square footage of it when you bought it? What is it now? Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great question. So uh, our place, we have a family of three. So two adults and one 11-year-old. And our house is 1,500 square feet down from 3,000, the previous one. And then, um, and then I recently cheated and built another 350 stu uh, square foot studio in the backyard, um, mostly to function as guest bedroom. Jesse Very slept there last night. Yeah. It's a little chilly at this time of year. But uh, yeah, so I guess we have 1,800 square feet, which is definitely not, not a tiny house, not very minimal. So uh, I don't kind of brag about having a small house. It's just, it's just medium for a three person family. Any other questions from you guys over here? Yeah, Leo. Um, so I, was, I think I was talking with Amy about this earlier. My name is Sean. I'm from Atlanta, but I'm moving to Fighting State um, shortly. And there's a lot of social norms and standards, I think, that people feel they need to conform to. And Pete, you know, I think you do a great job in your writing of making this type of lifestyle cool and fun. Um, so I think that's a better way to look at it. And so what I would ask you guys both is how you define, it can be loosely, success. Because um, when we say America is, well, that person's doing well, but that usually means is they're making money, mm -hmm. um, which is an important part of it, but as you say, it's what you say, not what you make. Yeah. So I would ask you guys that, how you define that within your families maybe and within yourself. I'll, I'll take that first. That's a good one. With your kids, it's hard because you have no idea if you're being successful or not until they're, I don't know, 40? I still don't know. <laughs> right now, it's like 50-50. But, um, but I, I determine uh, my life to be, you know, and there are ebbings and flowings on this as well, but if I'm learning things, if I'm acquiring new skills, getting better at something, or just learning, you know, new knowledge, learning how to do something, um, tinkering, then I've... I, I 
see it as success. So and like continue your education. Yeah, just if I, if I if I never can progress again, then I feel like that would be it's, it. We're done. You know what I mean? Yeah. Pete, what about you? Oh, well, I used to have these big, grand ideas of success, and then I've been breaking it down smaller more recently, where I realized like being happy, like having a happy life, is is really all you'd really that's you know what's the point of being successful if you're unhappy so I think happiness is a goal and then I learned even more this is like I've been repeating this statement a lot including in this book recently somebody else's book and uh, then I came to realize having a good day is all there is to being happy because there's only the present right there's no past or future really there's only now so if I'm happy at this moment and I go to bed after having a lot of happy moments happy presence through the day then uh, I'm like, man, I have a really happy life. And then if I have another day like that, and they really start to build up, and then you just feel quite convinced that you have a happy, successful life. So I've really focused on having my day, every day, be kind of a winning day. It doesn't have to be a heroic, like, save the world day, but you just have to do the things that make you happy, which, for me, it breaks down a certain basic, you know, basic ingredients, like having enough physical activity, getting outside, being social with people, being caring and giving at least somewhat and enough of that and you go to bed happy so you just keep doing that every day and suddenly you've got a great life so it's quite simple it doesn't even like doesn't even relate to your career or your wealth or anything like that and I think a lot of times people are looking for happiness this is you know as everyone knows this they're looking with the next thing you know like the next thing I buy when I finally get this or get that or get this raise and it's, it's pretty elusive you know in that way um, let's see what we've got here. So, where do you put money? To, oh, that's a good one. Um, where do you put money to retire? Do you use a Vanguard account or something like that, or have a few accounts? Yeah, just just index funds. I buy index funds. Always have since I learned about investing. Luckily, I learned early in my, you know, by the time I started making any money, I knew about index fund investing. So. Just throw it in, uh, like you know, into your your tax deferred stuff, the 401k, up to the limit, and then put the rest into the non 401k side, like a normal taxable account. I always used Vanguard for my savings days because that was the only one that existed at the time, and it's still great. And um, and then just like you know, there's a fund called VTI that Vanguard has. It's just everything, and uh, it works fine. You know, just do that for a few decades. And uh, leave it, and then it's, it's, it's very simple. But if there's an opportunity like like some kind of cryptocurrency that comes along. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Bitcoin. Just a couple Bitcoins is all you need to really retire. Well, I knew, this, I knew this guy, though. I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, they, uh, Seth asked, do you still endorse Betterment? You and I are both Betterment fans. I love Betterment for, for one reason, and that is you can take someone that's afraid of investing, and you can say, do this. And then they're doing it, and they cost a little money. But it's I've, John is the CEO of Betterment, and we know John pretty well. And I've always felt like he's kept the kept his fees for their tax loss harvesting, their fancy allocations reasonable enough. So the person that's afraid, yeah, I feel like he's being well taken care of. So I, I still really enjoy that. Yeah, yeah. The answer is yeah. I still like I put my money into Betterment, and the reason people criticize me on this, so I have to be careful because I don't want to sound like a salesman, but basically end up with the same Vanguard funds, but like a bunch of stuff that I would have been too lazy to buy yeah. and then automatically rebalanced a little bit. And then a little bit of tax trickiness that basically just shows up on your tax refund. So Betterment pays its own fees basically with the IRS's money by, <laughs> by managing your, um, you know, they, they more than pay their fees, which are really low. So, and it's just a little bit prettier to use. Um, I just try not to talk about it too much because you don't want to sound like you're advertising or it. Something, yeah. So Vanguard is kind of like the totally generic. No one will question you for recommending right. Vanguard, but they're both <laughs> they're both great. Yeah. Uh, Jesse and Pete, you both seem to optimize your. You you mentioned this already. It's optimize your lives for happiness. What's something you're looking to improve on next? I already mentioned my back squat, so I, that was fun. <laughs> um, what about yours? Oh man, I should have had an answer for this. How close are you? Four hundred. I hit 360 in August, but 10, you know, another 10% can be a long haul, you know? So, so yeah, we'll see what happens. You have to keep your eating game up to get that kind of I know, of and I have too. a hard time. I have a hard time letting loose to do that. Um, I would like to learn Japanese this year. I like converse, like to go, to go to the, I've never been. If anyone's been, I'd love to hear your experience. I've only heard good things, but I'd love to go and 
uh, take my kids and have them see. We went to Manhattan for this book launch and they got to see a brand new culture. And um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's actually way fun. But it's been cool to see my kids just like wide eyed and you know, Utah's a little different than Manhattan. And so it, it's been fun to see that. But I like to take them there and I'd like to be able to, to speak enough to like get by or not, you know, not remain lost, things like that. So. And that's Japanese, you're saying? Yeah, it seemed, it seemed hard. Like, it, that seems... I found out, I, I was like, oh, I'll learn the, the letters first. And then I read for like five minutes, and I'm like, well, then you have these three alphabets. And I got cold feet, but I'm going to still I'm gonna jump in. So. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I don't even have an answer for that. I'm just going to keep having my good days. I like it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow, good answer. I guess it was a good answer. Oh, yes, uh, Mr. Audience, would you like to come and... Uh, I'll just I'll do it from here. Okay. I'll um, repeat the question in case. Yeah. You know, some days you don't get to have a good day. Sometimes that just that's how like, the cards get dealt. Tell me about a time for both of you maybe where you felt like you, you had some adversity and what kind of truth you come back to when you feel that adversity that helps see you through it. <sighs> Deep. Okay, well for me, the most likely thing to cause adversity is like personal conflict. So if, if stuff is like rough in our family life, people are bickering, or if stuff from you know the community, if some, there was like a, a conflict with the neighbor in the in the next building here involving a baseball bat, I wasn't the guy with the baseball bat. And uh, you know, like when you feel a lot of anger and there's all this emotions and stuff like that, then uh, that that would be a good source example of a source of a bad day. Or the other source of bad days is when I don't do enough. Strangely enough, the most likely way for me to have a bad day is, is when I'm on vacation and I haven't thought about like what I'm going to do with my time. And I, I guess I'm a bit weird that if I just like sit on the beach and then go back and like take a nap and then, then I don't feel like doing anything. And then the not doing anything compounds into not wanting to do anything. And then I just feel like, I just totally wasted this day on a tropical island or whatever. <laughs> and uh, it just doesn't feel very good. So, but, so my solution is just to say, like, no big deal. In general, you have a very nice life, and, and it can help to write stuff down. So I'll just write down my plans for the next day. Like, what would a good day look like? Very simple, just like a piece of paper. And then that way you're going to sleep with those thoughts in your head. And then when you wake up the next day, you look at that again. And then it's pretty easy to execute the plan and then back to having good days. So, so it's uh, yeah, a piece of paper is the answer to that question. <laughs> Actually, it was mine. I, I do a daily journal, just a couple sentences. And I was just rereading it the other day. And you go through certain periods and you're like, oh, man, this was kind of glum for a while, you know. Um, but you, you just kind of push through. I agree also. Like, it only ever happens with the personal stuff. In, in, you know, in my business, if we've had issues you know, inside the team or issues dealing with like really, really hairy stuff, um, then that's, it's super stressful. But um, I used to think I could somehow manufacture or construct a life that would avoid stress and that <laughs> didn't work, you know. So I had to learn how to just recognize that it's there and not to stick it in my back and give myself low back pain and then it worked out after that. So, um, okay, Evan wants us to pick a fight, but he said, but no bats. So, um, <laughs> Evan said, what are the top financial topics you guys disagree on the most? Oh, gosh, Pete. I don't want to cause a bad day. <laughs> uh, well, Jesse did buy a Tesla for his car. <laughs> there we go. And then who got, who got to drive it to L.A.? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, uh, yeah, I'll talk about that for a moment. So I wanted one, I mean, obviously. <laughs> the, the Model 3 hat wasn't available, so I couldn't go for the, the Because non we can't delay gratification. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I was coping with stress. So, <laughs> no, I, uh, I was actually trying to put, this, sound, this will sound strange, but to be super straightforward, I was trying to cope with the idea of um, I had this really old Honda Civic that I was actually like reverse proud of. You guys know what that is where you'll see someone that's spending money and you're like, oh, I would never. And you, so you're actually kind of the jerk in that situation. <laughs> you know? 
And I felt like that with my Civic. Like, look at me. Like, I definitely could afford a better car, but I'm not like that schlub with the BMW, you know, which is a sweet driving machine. But, uh, so I actually was testing it, and I talk, literally talked to my therapist that I go to monthly to help me with handle, handle stress and be a good dad and stuff. And she was just like, why don't you do it? It's not that big a deal. You're making this out to be a big deal. And so, you know, at the behest of a therapist, a, a licensed <laughs> trainer, <laughs> I pulled the trigger. Now, my wife actually helped me the most. She's like, man, you've been doing this so, been talking about it so long, you should do it and see what happens. Best purchase I've ever made. <laughs> do you have a referral code for Tesla's? <laughs> For my next one, yeah. yeah, I probably do. I've never used it. But. Did you finance it? Uh, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the whole story. I lease it through the business. It's there's an advantage to that, and I was afraid to buy it because I was afraid that I would think it was going to be so great, and then I would own the car and be like, oh, this, I, it actually wasn't. Now my lease is up in a couple months or something, and I'll I'll just probably buy it out. Yeah. Oh, but I was cool. I was afraid to commit to actually lay down that much cash, and so I'm like, well, I'll just, you know, pay it and see what happens. It's been a good experiment, but um, yeah, I that, there's something we we maybe disagree on. And that's not even a disagreement. Really I actually uh, I was just joking. Like, <laughs> that that's the other uh, unknown thing about Mr. Money Mustache is I'm not really against people spending money if they have tons of it. It's more about or like if they have enough for whatever they want. Um, I'm more about like spending money that that harms other people, but I don't want to sound like a big softy, so I kind of just make this big. <laughs> yeah, so like, if, if he wanted like a diesel six wheel pickup truck, that's totally different than buying Tesla, because like, you know, the Tesla actually pushes and nudges the world forward a little bit, even though it's still a consuming resources, whereas the truck is pushing the industry in the backwards direction. So it's more like, you know, I'm, my blog is like an environmentalist and human, having a good time blog so that's what my rules are really about and then of course if you are like 99 percent of the people and have money problems as well well then you have to think about that too so should somebody who makes fifty thousand dollars a year and has debt buy a tesla like no you shouldn't even have a honda civic at that time you should be, get a good pair of gloves in your bike until you're out of debt so yeah, and then you will be tough enough to not need a car at that point. Oh, we have another live question. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Uh, so for those of us who haven't made it to early retirement, um, how would you guys recommend, I'd love to get both of your guys' takes on this, um, someone who has some amount of like student loan debt or they have a car loan, something like that, <gasps> and then they get a bonus, they get a 15% bonus and they have a chunk of cash. Uh, there's a psychological benefit of I can pay down my loan and I can get out of debt, um, even if, let's say, it's like a 1% rate or something like that, uh, versus investing it and knowing, like, oh, I could probably beat it on the return. How do you guys balance that? I'd love to get both of your perspectives. So people will often say that with house rates, too, because even house rates are so low. So they'll say, well, you could invest that in the market. And usually really number savvy people will say that. But, but then what happens is people don't invest the difference. So they'll... They'll always just be like, well, you can invest. Why would you pay off your house? You can invest that. And that, in theory, it's totally sound. And then no one invests the difference. They just talk about how you could. And then they just continue just living right up to their you know, limit. So I would turn it around and I'd say, would you borrow at 1% to invest in the market? And if you would, then I'd, I'd probably just hold on to the 1% loan and invest. I mean, that's, that's dirt cheap. Like, it might, you, some might even say you're being paid, you know, just with a little inflation. So, but be really honest with yourself with that. And uh, if you actually invest it and leave it and never, you know, truly, then I would be okay with it. Maybe you disagree, Pete. I don't know. Yeah, I totally agree. It's like a, a tiny fraction of the population that have this discipline. But if you are, and mustachians are that percent. So if you have that discipline to leave your loans out and invest, that's great. And in fact, um, even I should have a mortgage because um, I could easily make more off almost any investment than what today's mortgage rates are. So the only reason I don't is because the personal psychology, like the only reason to have more money is to feel better, right? And I actually feel really good about not having a mortgage, even though I have less money because of paying off my house, because I would have made more investments. But because my goal is feeling better rather than um, having more money, I just paid off the house and I still invest just invest a bit less. So you, you know, if you're at a stage when you want to keep earning money and you need to grow your wealth, then it's worth leveraging 
a little bit to push harder for your savings because the higher wealth is going to make you hopefully feel better. You're like, yeah, I'm going to be free earlier because of this. So, yeah, follow your heart is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a, it's a dangerous answer to, to give to, a, like, a, you know, because at one-on-one -on -one I, would, I would get a read on people and, and we would look at their budget and I would say, oh, no, you should definitely, like, get a hold of that and, and pay off the loan. Or you can tell when, how people talk about it that it's really bothering them, weighing on them, and that's, like Pete mentioned, that's the feelings. And, you know, at the end of the day, you, I, I did the same thing with my house. It was just, I don't want it. And it, felt, it felt really good not to have the mortgage. Yeah, would you guys ever recommend, you know, you kind of have the Dave Ramsey mentality of, like, just get rid of all debt, like, turn it all to zeros. Would you guys ever recommend doing a percentage? Or would you say, like, you know, do 50-50, where you're just like, cool, you can wipe out 50% of your loan, and then you can invest a huge chunk of it as well. Yeah, um, if your heart draws you that way, then you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had paid off my house, yeah. and then the real estate market was really, was really solidly like low priced for a while, you know, several years ago. And I borrowed, I got a loan to buy a rental property, and I felt like that was, I, I just felt good about it, you know. And and then um, you know you inch that one down, and then you try and repeat the process, and it, it speeds you along a little faster than paying cash for the house. Mm -hmm. But um, what most people aren't near this level of, of even being able to think about it. Sure. They're, they're, uh, they need to stop eating out as much, not because that's horrific or bad on its own, but because they're not intentionally deciding what makes them feel good, and makes them happy. And so money's just kind of flying away. And, and uh, we, just, we want to avoid that. When people start becoming really aware of their finances and what their money's doing, they end up becoming their own best financial advisors. So Pete can sit there and say, I feel good about this, and I can say that, and I'm sure you can say that as well, once you know what's going on. And then the final part of that picture that happens when you get older, like me, is that you realize that the stuff you own, like a house and like maybe a car and some furniture, that should be a small percentage of your overall savings anyway. You know, you shouldn't have a ton of stuff. So by the numbers, it shouldn't make a big difference whether you have loans on it or not, because your, your goal in life is not to own a bunch of stuff. So it should be a small decision. Like, sure, I'll make a bit more money by mortgaging it, but it's just my house. Like, big deal. My job is to keep my savings invested nicely. I'm going to own the stuff that I like to own a good life. But you, you basically don't think about that anymore. Like, once you're in the independent stage of life, uh, both money and the stuff you own are like background noise. And then your real mission is what are you going to do with your day? And that becomes a much bigger thing to think about. The next question is, who uh, is my favorite child? <laughs> um, and I think my kids might be watching, so I'm going to defer on that. <laughs> but, uh, uh, my favorite child is Simon. Yeah. <laughs> um, is there anything either of you absolutely refuse to pay for? Yeah. Wow. Liquor? <laughs> yeah. I don't drink, so I refuse to pay for my own liquor. I might buy someone else's, but I refuse to pay for my yeah. own. Sounds good. Um, I've, I guess I don't refuse, but I have never paid for like someone cutting my grass or like kind of basic, you know, finger. Oh yeah, definitely never gonna pay for someone to clip my fingernails <laughs> or toenails. I think that's a good solid answer. I can't think of anything else. Um, okay. First off, you got to do a weekly podcast. See, you're getting people assign you work. That's, that's what happens. That was for you, isn't it? No, I do oh, a weekly already does. podcast. Oh, well, yeah. that's good. perfect answer. <laughs> we should have you on more often. Secondly, done. do you have any opinions on whether to get married? I'm not lying about this. This is his question about whether to get married. And then he describes this woman. He's, no, I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> um, get married, have kids before you have a career or after. Well, this is great because I didn't wait to have kids. Mm -hmm. I started when I was 12. And then you, <laughs> uh, you waited a little bit. So I had, my first, uh, first was born when I was 23, still in school. I had two years of schooling left. And Pete waited a while. And I wouldn't go back and change mine. And I don't want to speak for you, but. Yeah. Man, that's, that is an excellent example of the contrast. I feel, and maybe it depends on your personality type, but I'm not really a guy who enjoys multitasking on stuff. I like to be really good at the thing I'm doing in life. So when I was a career guy, that's all I wanted to do. And I didn't want to have to go early home because somebody was sick and I wanted to be able to work on the weekends without asking anybody's permission. And uh, I also didn't want to have to worry about money when I was 
I was excited to be a dad like and be a really dedicated dad and just do that. So for me, it was really, if you're anything at all like me, which I don't know if anybody is, uh, very helpful to get your career out of the way first. Uh, marriage is separate. You know, you can be married without kids. You don't have to be like, connect those two events. But uh, the thing that's awesome is um, your 20s are such an amazing time to make money because you're very, your brain is at maximum power. Yeah, you can have no obligations and you're old enough for people to respect you and give you big paying jobs. So it's quite easy to make all of the money you need for your life in your 20s if you're lucky enough to know this at the beginning of your 20s, you know, and if you have a good career path. And then 30 is plenty uh, young to have healthy <coughs> children. So uh, unless you need six children, in which case you, you should start think earlier. ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Because um, otherwise a biological clock will tick. So, so yeah, I would say, um, there's no, it's definitely feasible to be done working before you have kids and it's a very joyful way to do it because it's, because there's, it cuts down the stress in your life. Yeah, absolutely. So this, this was the follow up. How do you prepare financially for kids? And I like this question because I don't think you have to prepare financially for kids beyond like, you know, the delivery of the child. That's, that can be expensive. Yeah. But I think there's a little bit of a myth that children are just astronomically expensive. I mean, you have to put them into the soccer club and you have to make sure they're on a traveling team and you have to make sure you give them all the latest clothing. But after that, <laughs> they're not that expensive. And each child requires an eight-passenger vehicle, like, per child. Yes. <laughs> and you got to make sure you're driving them all over the place. As need. No, they, they're, they're not. I think uh, adults make kids expensive. I don't think kids make kids expensive. Yeah, that's true. Except in the fact that they consume a lot of time. So if you are... If you can't work as much because you're busy being a parent, that costs you a lot of money. So diapers or the food for the kids or the clothes, that's like not very much. We kind of estimate it's $300 a month to have a kid. That's been fairly consistent since for our one kid since he was born. Um, but it's cost us like, I don't know, probably two or $3 million in foregone salary since he was born because, because we couldn't handle working and raising a kid at the same time. We chose not to handle it. Uh, Kenny asked, um, how, when do you teach your kids about money? And I mentioned I, I start them when they're eight and uh, give them an allowance that's pretty modest that they can use to learn how to mm -hmm. handle money uh, and then make them work for any other extra money that they, that they want beyond that. But um, I, just, I teach them what we teach adults, teach them how to budget. And um, what do you do with Simon? Anything different? You teach them how to invest a little bit, right? I mean, you have... Yeah, same deal. We're still on the Bank of Dad program, but that's not going to last too much longer. But uh, yeah, he keeps his money with me where I keep a spreadsheet and he gets 10% interest on his money that pays up monthly. So he sees the balance going and then and he has to pay for his own stuff. That's the key, like food and clothing and all that is free accommodation. Under the, uh, <laughs> Room and board is covered. Yeah, under my uh, elite parenting package that he's subscribed to. <laughs> but he has to, uh, if he wants video games or other toys or other things that aren't kind of nor standard, like child raising things, then he gets to buy them himself, which comes out of the spreadsheet. So then that way there's a trade off. He's like, oh, do I really want to sacrifice $25 or whatever just for this game? And then he's, he thinks about it because he knows that money's gone. And he knows that the passive income from that money is gone because now he's making like 20 plus dollars or maybe $10 a month from interest because he's got over $1,000 in there. Yeah, so. he's rolling it. So that, it's interesting that I mean, he's learning early on to that trade-off between kind of purchasing freedom or purchasing this thing now, I think people deal mm -hmm. with. Um, why index funds over target date funds? I, I use, this is from JD. I used to like target date funds a lot and then um, I realized, and there were lots of, not lots, there were a handful of academic studies that looked at target date fund allocations and they realized that they were far more aggressive than they would, than they should have been in with their date. So the fund says this money will be appropriate for you if you're retiring at 2020. They were far too into equities uh, hmm. than they should have been. And the reason is because they're still competing for dollars of investors. So if your temptation is I have to attract money to this fund, I want to have the show. I want to show the highest return possible for this fund, so that I can attract those dollars. The the temptation was, well, let's just stay a little more in equities, just a little longer. We think they'll hang on a little longer in order to get that return up a little more, 
instead of just abiding by the fact that the allocation should have been more conservative. So that kind of cooled me off on target date funds, and I feel like I just go index fund, total stock market, and. But that's actually the opposite approach because it means you have no bonds, you have all stocks. Uh, and then, yeah. Uh, and, and that's really my answer is keep, I think you don't need a target date fund because target date funds gradually shift you to bonds as you get to be older in order to protect you from volatility. But volatility isn't really a problem, like when you do the math on it. And I'm actually reading this book. Maybe I'll give this guy a little shout out because this is a Colorado author, Wealth by Virtue. So he really gets into like how you should stay in equities forever if you're tough enough to not be scared of a volat volatile stock market. And I like... Um, Volatility. I think it's fun, and I, I, you know, <laughs> I like seeing stocks on sale. And if I do have money, extra money that month, then I'll buy them. It has been a long time since stocks were on sale. But as long as you're trained to not be afraid of lower, like falling markets, and like want to sell, and if you're willing to be a bit flexible in your retirement, like, oh man, the stock market's down by 50%, maybe I won't take the most expensive possible vacation, like right now. Maybe I'll wait till next year because stock market crashes are always quite short lived. So um, you don't need a target date. You can just keep your money all in index funds for your whole life if you want and just live off the dividends and a tiny portion of the principal. And plus, like I always say, everyone has to keep working at something in order to have a good day. So you'll probably earn money throughout your retirement. Not every day necessarily, but occasionally. And that's going to feed into your, your pool too. Yeah. So. Um, but if you'd like the comfort, the target date fund is pretty good. Yeah, I, I, uh, they're a little more exp They're still very cheap, but they're a little more expensive than just a plain vanilla, you know, Yeah, like the expense stock. ratio is higher. Yeah, so yeah. They're, they're not as great that way. But yeah, I, I agree with what you said. Um, let's see. Um, what are your thoughts on travel? It doesn't feel like it's very frugal, but it really brings us a lot of happiness. I love travel. Yeah, you're traveling right now. Yes, according I'm, to my I'm a traveler records. today. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> what about you? you? You travel a bit? Yeah, I, we spend a lot of time, both me and sometimes the family and me together, uh, away from home. And it just depends how you do it. Travel can be anywhere from pop, like highly cash flow positive. Like, for example, if you own a house and you Airbnb that out while you're traveling and you do something that costs less than the $100 a night your house is bringing in or whatever, then you're getting paid to travel. Or on the other hand, if you leave your house empty and go to the Hilton and Hawaii and golf every day and just buy tourist stuff in the gift shop every night, then travel can be really expensive. So the only thing that's fixed about travel is the cost of moving your body. And that depends on how, you, how far you go and what transportation you're using. So just make it match your budget and your tastes. And uh, you know, if you're not super rich, then maybe don't try to travel like super rich people. And it can be, that's the big mistake is everybody travels like super rich people, yeah. they're like, yeah, of course you you do all this stuff because that's what everybody does. Yeah, I so, call it playing rich. We should, yeah, playing rich. We should rich. play rich for a little while here. And, and that's how everyone does their weddings too. Like another one of my pet peeves is like oh, everyone has yeah. to have a $30,000 wedding even if they have uh, negative dollars to start with. You so. would have loved my wedding. Very, very <laughs> cheap. Very cheap. Oh, okay. Don't skip out on the photographer though. That was our one regret. <laughs> we went too cheap on the photographer. I know he's not watching, so... <laughs> <laughs> I, that was my only regret. But yeah. Um, and on the travel, when people say we love to travel, it brings us a lot of happiness. I, when someone says that to me, like, this makes me happy, I love this, I just try and ask why, like six or seven times, why do you like to travel? Why, why, why? And pretty soon they kind of unpack or peel back the onion of that happiness onion. And they're like, oh, it's because I'm with my family and we're in this more like concentrated environment and there are no other distractions and we get to see a new place and meet new people. And then they haven't listed one thing that cost any money yet. And so we have to just be, be honest with ourselves about why that makes us happy. And a lot of times when you unravel it, it's, it's just, goes back to relationships, experiences, social things, stuff like that. So, um, do you guys use churning at all for your travels? I tried it once. Way too much of a headache. <laughs> Just in case you guys wonder what he's talking about, he oh, means sorry, like yeah. uh, getting credit cards that have a super high travel bonus. Uh, you know, like a bunch of you get several plane tickets worth for getting a credit for getting a credit card, and then you can do that multiple times, and it's like a really big thing in the frugal community, I guess. 
and people have fun with it and I don't do it. I get like one new credit card per year, like whatever one gives you the most, like maybe $500 or $1,000. And then I just, so that's my limited churn. Um, just because it's, it's only fun if you're, if you're doing it because you enjoy the game. You shouldn't do it just to get these chunks of 500, unless you're really good at it, I guess. Because yeah. it does burn up some of your mental time and it makes people travel more than they would in, in ways they might not otherwise do. Like, oh wow, I can get like a, one of those entire rooms in a jet and go to Dubai and like stay in a palace, <laughs> all for just like signing up for 50 credit cards and churning them the whole year. That's amazing, it's free. And like, yeah, but you wouldn't have done that. Like, so you should use it to do travel that you would have done anyway and then just save the money from that instead of using it to inflate your travel and suddenly you're staying in like, Hilton golf resorts again, you know, just because it's free doesn't mean it's it's worth yeah. doing. And I would have to do so many to get tickets for all my kids, I just gave up a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, we're running short on time here, so there, there are a lot we won't get to. Um, and we've hardly done any live questions. I know, does anyone have any here? I'm just going to stretch my Go legs for a second. Uh, what would you consider would be like a financial and personal, I guess two questions, Financial and personal regret. Ooh. Uh, personal regret was how I proposed to my wife. <laughs> Not that I proposed. How? How I proposed. Uh, financial regret was a guy I hired to replace our version of the software back in 2007. And uh, he totally scammed me. I lost like 70 grand on it. So. What even made it hurt more was we had just bought a new house, first home. And uh, we, we, did, we made the mistake of saying, this will be our forever home, we'll just grow into it. And we bought too much home, but that, it was affordable and all that. But the only part that was bad about having a large home is we couldn't buy any furniture for it. But if I would have had even a fraction of that 70 grand that that guy has now, um, I could have bought some furniture. So at I remember, a bed. <laughs> at least a bed. So I remember going home and telling Julie what had happened. Like uh, we couldn't, the, the, the software was in such bad shape and he was like, hey, I'm done. This is what you wanted. And I, I mean, I would have had to like sue to try and, you know, it was a write off. So I remember going home to Julie and like my voice literally echoing as I tell her, like, I, we have to restart this. You know? And she was like, okay. So bless her heart, you know. Anyway, any personal or financial mistakes that, or regrets? Yeah, I had a. I was too confident when I first retired and I was like, now I'm going to do a construction company because I like construction. So instead of doing a fun retirement business, I started a super stressful like house building company with a friend and borrowed money, like got construction loans and bought four plots of land and started building luxury houses on them. It was totally not a retirement at all. I was like super worried every night and uh, I was, there was no need to do this at all. So that took actually multiple years to unwind that mistake because I had to like build the houses and then the housing crash happened and we had to sell them and rent them out. And I gradually got, you know, once we closed the business, that reduced most of the stress. But, you know, I, I basically wasted five years of my retirement having less fun than I would have initially. So, uh, but now, now that that's already, even the last of those years is already quite a few years in the rearview mirror, I'm quite happy about it because the life now seems so excellent by comparison. <laughs> so, you know, you can always make, a, make good of something um, not once you get through it, but I would, I would certainly not repeat that <laughs> or yeah. tell anybody to do that yeah. as their idea. And it did cost some money too, like I lost like $200,000, which yeah. caused me to have to um, be a bit more frugal for a while and earn a bit of money. But it turns out that was the fun part, is earning money to re rebuild your savings, so. Yeah, you can't dwell on it too much, but. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jeff asks, who would win in an arm wrestling match? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think it'd be a draw, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's right. <laughs> um, Good sport. Okay, let's see. So Jessica threw me a softball. She said, who should budget? And I know you, you, you basically manage your, <laughs> manage your expenses so low that it's, you're, you're almost like on autopilot, just you've trained and practiced. But for someone that's not living like that, the way Pete has habitually developed that, over time I would say everyone needs one. And then you'll notice after years of building new habits of spending and money awareness, you can be less and less uh, 
intense about it and it doesn't have to be this daily thing where you're checking and updating but for people that are really coming from the norm the 80 percent norm and they want to change their behavior i would say you should budget and you should be in there daily really try and you know reinforce it so that was a big shock to me because i came to my way not seeing what normal people did so i thought i was normal <laughs> and, then, uh, and then i met America, and I met. <laughs> I Who met is this Norman. person? What is she like? Yeah. <laughs> and then I talked to Jesse about like what uh, typical people are like, including YNAB customers. And YNAB customers are maybe even ahead because they are, at least are thinking about it enough to come across the company. But it turns out that um, that most people just don't pay any attention to their their spending at all. They just kind of like buy stuff as it comes past yeah. their face. And then they run out of money, so maybe the responsible ones will stop, and the other people will just keep spending, so it's even more crazy. Yeah. And then, so you were interviewing me, and I was like, well, I, I never have a budget. I, I just never thought it would be necessary. And then you probed with more questions, and then you realized, oh, no, you, Pete, you've always had a budget. It's just every category was zero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it took us a while to get there, but yeah, we yeah. got there. Yeah, it's like you never... I don't actually spend zero in any category, but the goal was always zero. It's always like, hmm, okay, that thing, I can get the food at this price, or but if I do it this way, I can get the food at that price. And is there any better way to do it? No, okay, now we move on to the next subject. <laughs> and so everything was always targeted to be minimum. And that was fun for me. And uh, so, that's, so it is kind of like a budget with zero. And then you just always fail a little bit, but you don't fail too bad. Exactly. And it yeah. work, results in a lower than average spending. Um, so we should wrap up. And for wine abbers that hadn't heard of Pete, MrMoneyMustache.com is where you can go. And you can have them start at the beginning and spend several days. And you know what you can do now that's even way better? Okay. Is you can get the app, the Mr. Money Mustache app, thanks to some readers who are like super hardcore developers. So you'll see that on the page. There's a link to download it. It makes it into a book, which is another reason that I don't have to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> The blog articles from the beginning are super nice, and you can read them offline. And of course, it's a free app, and um, and there's a Android and iPhone version, I think now. So excellent. Okay. And uh, we can't we can't advertise unit budget other than showing the shirt, but yeah. I'm sure you can um, figure out how to how to get in touch with them if you're <laughs> in if you need a budget. Okay. Thanks, everybody. It's been fun. Yeah. <laughs>